Okay, so let's cover a little bit more aspects of display since this is a course which is in electrical engineering department. We should understand how we electrically drive large arrays of pixels. And so in the lab this week, you're going to do direct drive displays like this, where basically they snake the electrodes in here and they make direct contact to each pixel. And so that's easy because there's not that many voltage controls. However, if you have a pixel array of M rows and N columns, then you're going to need M by N voltage controls. So if you have a thousand by thousand pixels in your display, that's a million voltage controls. So one option would be that you could connect one million wires to the back of your cell phone display. But if you did that, the wires themselves would weigh, you know, way more than the cell phone it does, itself does. So obviously there's a more elegant way to do that. So instead you use pa matrix addressing, and there's two types. The first type is passive matrix addressing where the number of wires you need is M plus N controls. So a thousand rows plus a thousand columns equals two thousand total connections. And so what you have there is you basically have a pixel material here and then you have these aluminum row column, row electrodes and ITO columns. So the ITO goes this way, the aluminum goes this way and at the intersection of each of them you get a pixel, okay? Now the aluminum in this simple reflect, this is a real reflective type display, is reflective. ITO is a transparent electrode. I'll talk more about that in a second. So you'll be able to see through this and see the liquid crystal or whatever you're trying to drive, okay? Now don't worry about the polarizers and everything else. This is just a simple explanation to look at the electrical drive. All right, so how's this work? Well, let's assume our pixels are made of something that requires 10 volts to switch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply 5 volts to the first row and data to the columns of minus 5 volts or plus 5 volts. So I put 5 volts to the first row and I keep all the other rows at 0 volts. And I just want to change the first row. Then I put data on the column electrodes. And so if I have plus 5 here and minus 5 here, the difference is 10 volts, this will switch. Here I bid plus 5 and plus 5, no voltage, no switching, no switching, no switching. Switch, because it's minus 5 and plus 5, the difference is 10 volts, this will switch. 10 switches, switches, no switch, and switch. So now I've been able to write the pixels in the first row. The other rows, nothing happened, because we said, remember, you need 10 volts to switch. Because I set these to 0, regardless if I do minus 5 or plus 5, these are never more than 10 volts dropped across there. They're only minus 5 or plus 5. So these don't switch. So this way you only switch the first row. When you want to go on and then switch the second row here, you set this to plus 5 and you set this to 0. Then you'll get those differences of 0 or 10. Then you do the same. Then you set the, these to 0. Then you set this to 5. Set this to 5 and you write it one row at a time and you work your way down the display. So fairly simple but there are some issues and limitations. Let's say it takes the pixel material, whatever it is, 20 milliseconds to switch, and there were a thousand rows, then if you were to scan through all those rows one at a time, it would take two seconds for one update of your display screen. And so there's no way you could do video. It would take two seconds to change it from one image to another. Furthermore, if this is gonna work, you need a threshold voltage hysteresis or nonlinear pixel response. Basically, you need these, what that means is that you need the pixel material to, you know, not respond until it gets to some kind of threshold voltage, such as it takes 10 volts to switch it, but 9 volts won't switch it. So that would be a highly nonlinear type response. And typically, you need the pixel to be stable without voltage because once you set this voltage, you want the pixel to stay in that state as you go and go to the other lines until you come back, it stays stable. So these all make it a little bit challenging, and you can only use it for several types of displays. Now, if you want video, then you need something called Active Matrix. The exception would be really fast pixels like MEM, micro, MEMS, which is microelectromechanical systems, or ferroelectric liquid crystals. And if you want high quality grayscale, then you also need Active Matrix. Okay? And so, how, what's Active Matrix? Well, all displays you see that are high quality, OLEDs, LCDs, LCD TV, cell phones, those use Active Matrix, which works as follows. I have row electrodes and I have column electrodes. What happens is I turn a row electrode on and then the voltage on that row electrode will come down and it will turn all these TFTs on. Okay, so now these TFTs which are thin film transistors are turned on such that data 
from my columns can then come through the transistor and charge up the pixel electrodes. So the data then can come through the, the, the columns and charge up the pixel. Now, these other rows down here were not turned on with voltage, okay? And so when data tries to come down to these and turn them on, it can't make it because their transistors were not turned on. So this way I can send data down the columns and turn on one row at a time. How is this different than passive matrix? Well, one way it's different is that I can charge up this pixel electrode to any voltage I want. Then I can turn this transistor off and the voltage I put on here could stay and continue to switch the pixel. So if let's say the pixel takes 20 milliseconds to switch, which was too slow if we had a thousand rows, it doesn't matter. I'll put the voltage, then I'll turn this row off, and then I'll leave this, and that voltage will still be there and still switch the pixel even after I've left that row because the voltage was still stored on there, and it won't come off because I turned this transistor off. To help hold that voltage, sometimes you add a storage capacitor like you see here. So you put the charge in, charge it up the capacitor, which helps hold the voltage on the pixel, keeping it switching even after you move past this electrode and you go to the next row, the next row, the next row. Okay? These transistors are called thin film transistors, which are adjacent to each electrode. And the reason why they're called thin film transistors is they're not made from a wafer. So a typical transistor is made with a silicon wafer. These are actually deposited on the glass of the display as thin films. So it's thin films such as silicon, and that's why they're called thin film, semi, uh, thin film transistors or TFTs. What are the issues and limitations? Well, the TFT has to do its stuff pretty fast. Let's say that you have 30 hertz. So you do a 30 hertz refresh rate in 1,000 rows. Then the amount of time you can spend, if you calculate this, one, se one second, 30 frames per second, 1,000 rows, is in the range of... 10 to 40 microseconds, if you do the calculation, you can spend at each, each pixel. So that's all the time you have to charge this up. So you, you need, it just can't have too much capacitance because you won't have enough time to charge it up. Also, the TFTs themselves, there's a transistor here, so it blocks some light, and they're not free. They're more expensive. So this approach is more expensive than the passive matrix approach, but this is what's dominant if you look at LCD TVs. So what about OLEDs? Well, OLEDs are different from LCDs in that they don't act as a light valve where they take a backlight and let it be transmitted or, or, or blocked, but rather OLEDs generate their own light. So you basically have two contacts, and it kind of like is like a PN junction where you eject electron to holes, they recombine, and you get light emission. And typically, the anode in an OLED is made of indium tin oxide. This is the same material that's used to make transparent electrodes for LCDs, too. It's basically indium oxide doped with 10% tin oxide. The indium oxide is a wide band gap semiconductor and the tin oxide is the dopant which gives it a lot of uh, high conductivity. And its abbreviation is ITO. People could just call it, instead of saying indium tin oxide, they just call it ITO. These are sheets of ITO coated on glass and you can see they're highly transparent, but they're also highly conductive. So, let's say you make this and you want to make a display and let's before we talk about how you drive it, let's talk about how you make a full color OLED. And so there's two ways you could do this. One is you could make red OLED, green OLED, and blue OLED side by side. The other approach is you make a white OLED, and then you put RGB color filters on front. There are disadvantages and advantages for each. The disadvantage for this is that you have to fabricate three different type of OLEDs on the same substrate. So you have to do the process for this, build up all the layers, this, this, and typically an OLED has more than two layers. It sometimes has as many as, as a dozen different materials to make it work really well. But the advantage is, is this is very this could be very efficient. There's no optical losses here. The light just comes right out. Now, this white approach is simpler. It's colored by white because I make the white layer and I just have to deposit that using just one, one type of OLED. So it's an OLED that's typically has some fluorescent material that's there. We'll talk more about that in, when we talk about emitters and detectors. But you can get white light emission, and I just make these all at one time, so I don't have to make three steps. Simpler to make, lower cost. Disadvantage is this color filter out front. It only lets a third of the visible spectrum through. So if you calculate your net efficiency for this, this is each pixel divided by the donal tumor pixels. You only get a third as efficient as this would be optically. So there's some trade-offs there in cost versus performance. Now, when you drive an OLED display, you do not use conventional active matrix like we described for LCDs, where you just have basically, you have rows, 
that turn on transistors that allow data from columns to come in. For an OLED, you use this approach. And the reason why is that you can't drive an OLED. An OLED is a current-driven device. So for an LCD pixel, you just apply voltage to it, and then you can leave that pixel. The voltage will stay stored on the pixel and slowly switch it to its state while you go on and you write the other rows. But for an OLED, if you take the voltage off, it turns off because an OLED needs to have voltage constantly on it to drive through the OLED diode to keep it emitting light So, because it is an organic light-emitting diode. And so how this circuit works, instead of having just one transistor and one transistor for each pixel, you have a more complicated multi-transistor approach where it works as follows. So basically, this is the row here, okay? The row turns on this transistor. This is the column, so they'd be coming down, and then it could send column data into here. Now, once you've written the column data here, you turn off the row, and then that voltage is held here and it's stored on here with this capacitor. But we need a current to be held, right? Well, the beauty is this voltage is held here. It holds a voltage on this transistor, which then sets the current level that gets through this from VDD to VSS, okay? And so if you do is a high voltage here, it will hold here, you get lots of current, low voltage here, not so much current. Key point is that you can quickly write the column voltage here, then turn that row off and that voltage will keep the current flowing and then you can go on to the next row and set the voltage levels for those pixels and so on. That's uh, one of the la last things I want to talk about is reflective displays. So we talked about LCDs, we talked about OLEDs. What about reflective displays? Well, if we want to talk about reflective displays, we need to first understand reflection and what that means in terms of uh, color space and brightness. So what you have here is this is a plot of, of L star, A star, B star color space. And, Basically, the bigger these shapes are, the more colorful and bright something is. So there's three technologies here. The first one, this, this black thing, is, is snap. That's newsprint. So that's a newspaper quality color and brightness, which is kind of gray and washed out. The green space here is swap, which is magazine quality color space. So high quality color and brightness. And then you've got LCD which has the biggest color space of all because it can be brighter than paper. You know, you can, make, you can just keep cranking up the brightness and make it very bright. So this is in an indoor environment you're comparing these technologies. So why do you want L reflective displays? Well, reflective displays have a couple advantages, one of which is they don't consume as much power because you don't need a backlight, right? And so a little wristwatch can run off a small battery for a long period of time because it just uses reflective light around it to generate the image. But again, what if I go from indoors to outdoors? Well, if you go, then what you see is that the color space has changed dramatically. The LCD color space collapses, whereas the reflectives look the same because they can just use the light outdoors to look just as good as they do indoors. And so the LCD color space gets washed out because its light coming out of it can't compete with sunlight around you. So here's an iPad in sunlight, and you can see how dark the screen is versus a reflective Kindle here. And so that's one of the key advantages for reflective displays. So how do they work? Well, one of the most dominant approaches for reflective displays is e-ink, and that's what's seen in the those reflective Kindles there. It's pretty simple how it works. Basically, you've got a pixel here. Here's a ITO electrode. Here's some um, aluminum electrodes probably connected to transit, uh, thin film transistors, TFTs. And you put voltages, and this ink basically has white particles and black particles with charges. So if I put positive voltage here, or if I put negative voltage here, it attracts the positive up, and it pushes the negatives down here. Let's say I put, and let me just go ahead and draw it on here. Let's say I put negative voltage here. Then that would attract the positive particles this way and push the negative that way. And if I put no voltage or I mix these up with voltages, I get them in a mixed state. Well, in this case, if the white particles are in the front, this will look white, like these areas here. If the black ar particles are pushed to the front, it will look black, and I get a mixed state where I get a grayscale color, okay, in between. And so these particles basically are reflective. They're colored white, and they're adequately reflective, and this stuff is just, they're, these things, the inks are kind of held in little pockets, so that if you push the display here, not all the fluid just goes squirting out to here. So this kind of keeps the the fluid localized and doesn't let it squirt all over the place by having them in these little sacks. And so how you could generate color for this is you generate, you put color filters on front and they typically use a, a red, green, blue, white color filter 
because the problem is why they add the white subpixel is that when you do this and you add this to this display this thing starts to look very dim here's a monochrome unit here's a color unit you see it gets very dark and that's because the color filters only let a third of the visible spectrum through right and so this gray display becomes almost black and so they add this white subpixel just to boost the overall reflection so e-ink the advantages it has it's highly readable high contrast it's zero power once you put an image on here these particles stay where they need to be and so it's going to continue to flourish but it's slow and so you know it's it's good for signage and for books but not video or any multimedia application so it's limited in application one other technology to show you because it relies on principles we've talked about in class is one which can be video rate and that's a uh, Mirasol by Qualcomm it's a reflective MEMS technology microelectromechanical and here's an image of the display in reflective mode there's also a front light which can bring the light from the front panel to shine it down onto it and then make it look a little bit brighter and how it works is basically it creates an interference cavity here where you get a resonant air gap so if you look at an oil film on water it has colors well they basically change the equivalent rainbow effect of an oil film on water by doing different thicknesses for this air gap so this one would have the largest air gap largest would give you the longest wavelength reflection which would be red this would be green and this has the smallest air gap which would be blue and there's some other optical film stacks, et cetera, that give you a good, strong reflectance from this. Then what they do with this reflective membrane, if you want to make the pixel turn black, they collapse it. Well, at that point, the resonance shifts to even, sh if, the, if the gap becomes shorter, remember, the long gap, middle gap, short gap, it's shifting to shorter wavelengths. If you collapse it, it shifts it all the way in the ultraviolet. The, the human eye cannot see ultraviolet, right? and so this will appear black. So that's how you switch these pixels on and off and it's based on interference principles. Um, and you know the key thing is that if you have a, a multiple layers like you have in here there's only one wavelength of light that will be able to, to reflect from the system by interference principles. And the same thing for an oil film on water. So they've worked on this for 20 years, two billion dollars invested, they've had some challenges one of the challenges is that this thing looks good if you look more straight on, but if you go for an angle, it looks black. Why is that? Remember, this is based on interference, and interference is based on optical path length. So the path length in and out here is one thing, but if I come at an angle, the display thinks that's almost like a longer wavelength light, and the interference won't work for that, and essentially it starts to look black. So it's a strong angular dependence. The other limitation is that this can never give a bright white reflection, which you can see by looking at this, because at the end of the day, you never can make these reflect white light. Interference is only working for one wavelength of light, right? And so the best you could do is you could put a red, green, and blue subpixel together, because you can't set these to white, because that interference only works for parts of the visible spectrum. And by doing that, you automatically cut your reflection down to a third of the visible spectrum because only each of these reflects a third of the visible spectrum. So at most this can be 33 percent reflectance at absolute best which is going to look a lot uh, less bright than paper. Okay so that's it. Almost. I'll get to that in a second. Answer this review question but we're not quite done yet. There's one more part C. It's on the spectrometer used in lab this week so you can understand how it works before you go into lab. And that'll be a quick video, just two slides. So finish this one up and then check out that video.